Hello everyone, I hope you and your families are staying safe and well. Here's my deep dive on Rachel Hollis. Come with me down the Karen rabbit hole. couldn't resist the cake and then figured there was no point. And some of them I knew exactly where the quote came from. I hadn't followed her everywhere. Um... anything from YouTube comments recently. It's if you criticize anyone, and I mean anyone, it means that you're automatically jealous of them. So just to get ahead of all of those comments, I just wanted to say first and foremost. <laughs> yes, I'm jealous of Rachel. I wish I was a motivational speaker just bankrolled by the most predatory companies in the world to parrot quotes that all the authors have written and I'm passing them off as my own in front of thousands of millions of impressionable women just to inspire them to sink further into debt whilst not acknowledging one iota of my own privilege. <laughs> I just wish I was her. <sighs> okay, so now we've got that off our chest. I work out every single day of my life, even if it's for only 15 minutes, um, but I do something every day. I'll like do push-ups. I'll actually physically push myself to do something with my body that feels hard because I'm like, oh, sis. You know, you did 50 push-ups this morning. Like, this meanie on Instagram is nothing. Oh, girl, you're gonna have to run 10 marathons and lift a house to deal with this video. You may have seen my recent deep dive videos on the MLM company, Lula wrote the speech that Katy Perry gave to the screaming Huns, many of the Instagram pep talks that Deanne would give us about just being happy and happiness is a choice. It's a wonderful feeling to wake up in the morning and go, I can decide, I choose to be positive. I decide, I'm the one that can change things. <laughs> And I mentioned toxic positivity. The idea that you can just do anything that you want to in life, you just do it. You choose your moods. If you're upset or depressed, go on and bottle that up. Screw the cap on tightly. Just hide it so far up deep inside of you that you start walking funny. <laughs> well, Rachel Hollis seems to make money out of that kind of mindset, being the literal personification of that mindset. If you melted down all of the live, laugh, love wall decals in the whole world and morphed them into a five foot two Caucasian woman, Rachel Hollis would be that. Why do so many people have those live, laugh, love signs? Are they forgetting to live laugh and love <gasps> oh my god there's no pulse look at the sign look at the sign oh i forgot to live <laughs> i'm fine i'm fine and then i said that's not a camel that's my wife oh. <laughs> i love you Oh, I love you too. <laughs> Being stuck in quarantine recently, I've uh, ended up reading her book, Girl, Wash Your Face. I, I, I went into the book with an open mind. I'm gonna be very fair on her. I'm giving my own personal opinions on her work uh, and her general message. And if you agree or don't agree with anything that I say, then I'd love to hear it in the comments. I do try and read every comment that I get, but please, just please be nice. Anyone who has a different opinion on a subject to you has come to that decision because of the experiences that they've had in their life that has led them up to this point. So just be respectful to me and to other people. I'm here discussing this book because I, I find the issues that surround Rachel Hollis to be very interesting and how they affect the politics and socio-economic situation of our times. 
So without further ado, if you've ever seen any of my videos before, you'd know that I like to go way too deep when I research any subject. And I have dug so far deep into Rachel Hollis that I am currently in her lower intestine. You can see the frustration and the contempt for her husband that she's hidden deep inside. I can see the green smoothie that she ate for breakfast and I know what her farts smell like. Uh, she would lead you to think that they smell just like yours, <laughs> but they don't. They reek of those horrible green smoothies, protein shakes and privilege. But wait, wait, what's that? Is that, is that a whiff of morals? No. Before we get into the nitty gritty, let's get some background knowledge on Ray Ray. Rachel Hollis was born a Pentecostal preacher, her grandfather also being a preacher, and lived a childhood watching her father speaking to his congregation, trying to uplift the lives of people through God. Rachel describes her childhood as traumatic in her book and during her public speeches. Her father had a temper and would punch the walls. He would ignore her unless she'd achieved something massive, and her parents were going through a divorce, and when she was 14, Rachel found her older brother after he'd sadly taken his own life after battling with mental illness for many years. My parents' marriage was abysmal. Like, the entire time I was alive and they were together was abysmal. Uh, Dad has a really bad temper. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm, a, I'm the daughter of a Pentecostal minister, and uh, we were that, like, everything looks perfect on the outside, and on the inside, you know, punching holes in the wall, mm. screaming. Mm. At the age of 19, Rachel decided she desperately needed to leave her family and she graduated from high school early, started a college degree and dropped out after one year because she'd landed a job at Miramax in LA. I only went to one year of college. I think it's so neat that I have maybe garnered enough life experience that even though I didn't go through school, I have um, some wisdom to impart. Rachel's LA dream was to become an actor, and as she says in her book, to meet Matt Damon and marry him. Instead, she met Dave Hollis. He was a Disney executive. So after two years together, they got married and Rachel left her job at Miramax to start her own company, a party planning business. She ended up throwing parties for Bradley Cooper, Rashida Jones, the Karen, and Al Gore and moved on to corporate events as well, even planning the Sundance Film Festival. During this time, Rachel also had dreams of being an author. She wrote three fiction books, Party Girl, Smart Girl, and Sweet Girl. Party Girl was a fiction based on her own life, uh, focusing on the culture shock of an innocent virgin Christian girl moving to the glitz and glamour and raunchiness of LA to become a party planner for big name celebrities. When she first wrote Party Girl, it was rejected by her publishers because they thought the book would not sell. They asked Rachel to add some sex and she refused. So instead she Googled how to self-publish a book. The book ended up being a huge success despite her refusal to add a little bit of filth. Rachel also set up a blog to prop up her party planning business as a bit of a marketing tool, but it ended up taking off on its own right, garnering 200,000 visitors a month. More and more women signed up to Rachel's online brand of lifestyle tips, style tips, and recipes. Eggland's Best Eggs reaches out and they say, we want to give you $250 oh. if you will put our eggs in your next recipe. The blog soon became a bigger money maker for Rachel than the party planning. She decided to pursue it full time. Rachel uploaded a photo of herself in a bikini showing stretch mark with an uplifting caption about body positivity and other women shared the post in their thousands and it went quickly viral. Other women started sharing their own bikini photos with their stretch marks and other imperfections and she started a mini movement for body positivity online. Rachel loved the feeling of empowering women and she wrote another blog post about her struggle suffering with Bell's palsy, which causes your facial muscles to paralyze, and it's normally caused by stress. Her publisher told her to take the picture down, thinking it would damage Rachel's image, but she refused. She said it was inspiring to other women to post her imperfections. Again, her audience was in love with the sentiment and began sending her messages and sharing their own struggles and stress with health problems. This is when Rachel decided she wanted to enter their self-help space. In 2018, Rachel wrote, girl, wash your face. 
and mainly through word of mouth, the book made the New York Times bestseller list. That girl wash your face is a New York Times bestseller. <laughs> I did not think it was going to happen. I Her book was endorsed by celebrities including Drew Barrymore and Reese Witherspoon. And high off the success of Girl Wash Your Face in 2018, Rachel went on to write Girl Stop Apologizing in 2019, which also made the New York Times bestseller list. High off the success of Rachel's second self-help book, husband Dave decided to leave his job at Disney and pursue his own career in the self-help space after Rachel had convinced him to attend a Tony Robbins conference and it changed both of their lives. Rachel is now 37 and her media empire along with Dave on board is thriving. She has four children ages 3, 7, 11 and 13 and she has two podcasts as well, one called Rise and another one called Rise Together which she hosts with Dave as a sort of marriage counselling podcast. On top of that, Rachel and Dave regularly throw conferences themselves. For example, a weekend long Rise event in Dallas sold out in only two and a half hours. Rachel and Dave also hold marriage conferences and she calls them getaway weekends. And one of them reportedly cost $1,795 per couple for two days in September. Hotel not included, no refunds. Every day before 8 a.m., Rachel gets up, works out, feeds the kids, does her morning Instagram slash Facebook live feed with Dave, writes five things she's grateful for in her gratitude journal, and then hits the ground running. And we had the three o'clock dance party today, and the song we all danced to was Don't Stop Believin' by Journey. Great, an office dance party. That sounds like an awesome place to work. <laughs> Call it the non-confrontational wing of the hashtag MeToo movement or Goop for red state women. Hollis is carving out a safe place for women who want to be strong and successful but may be uneasy about saying so out loud or even identifying themselves as feminists. Girl Wash Your Face is published under a Christian imprint and has sold most strongly in the South and the Midwest. Hollis's most ardent devotees are mothers and female entrepreneurs many of them working from home. At the time of recording, Rachel has 1.6 million followers on Facebook and 1.8 million on Instagram. It's no question that Rachel has gained a huge following and has been massively successful in what she does. And she has an unfathomable work ethic. But is her message a healthy one for all women? Let's have a look at the main subjects Rachel gives advice on in her book and in all of her work and try to answer that question. Now the first thing to note about Rachel is that she's not a licensed therapist, but she does believe that she's qualified enough to advise people on their mental health and states things as fact that sometimes seem to be dubious at best. If I told you that I know a way to rewire your brain for happiness, would you believe me? Girl, I've got you. But to her credit, she does advise women to go to therapy. Who goes to therapy, wants to go to therapy, think about therapy? Are you kidding me? She also mentions actual mental health disorders in her book on page five and does advise people to deal with those serious mental issues with professionals and work through them properly, which is good. But she does go on to say that your sadness and she makes sure to distinguish sadness from actual depression is caused by you, basically. In the introduction to the book, the very beginning, a quote on the first page is, the truth, you and only you are ultimately responsible for who you become and how happy you are. That's the takeaway. It's also the first time we read that Rachel likes to call her fans her tribe, which just feels wrong. So I'm gonna avoid using the word tribe for the rest of this video. But there's this one idea that carries through the book um, that also carries into her online presence and that becomes her tagline. We choose joy. She's even got it on a t-shirt. It does remind me of my journey into the world of LuLaRoe and the way Mark would just gaslight people and tell them that they're choosing to be upset when he'd them over with yet another failed launch. So in response to this, I think there's a lot of benefits to feeling angry. Like if you sit there feeling angry about something, 
as long as you're a constructive kind of angry person you can sort of get all of your thoughts in a line and decide what you want to do with the feeling it might be having a chat having a word with the person who you off or sorting sorting the thing out that pissed you off in the first place but if i just decided to like dance to my favorite song and choose joy and try and forget about it then the same thing's just gonna come back and bite me in the ass, isn't it? It's just, it's just gonna f me off again, isn't it? So Rachel met Dave Hollis when she was 19 years old and working at Miramac. He was 27. She was 19 and he was 27. Can I make it any more obvious? They met in 2002 and married in 2004. So let's look at how this beautiful love story started, shall we? On page 44 of Girl, Wash Your Face, I uh, should have it bookmarked here, Rachel describes seeing Dave for the first time. In my mind, he turns around in slow motion. The memory illuminates when I first see his face. He smiles at me and reaches out a hand to shake mine. The moment stretches into infinity and then snaps back together like elastic. It speeds back up into real time. Rachel goes on to say that Dave has a lifetime of dating experience ahead of her, being 27 years old and she's 19, and she's also a Christian girl, and he never asked her age and she also never volunteered the information. He asked her out on the first real date that she'd ever been on. She dressed up to the nines and he turned up casually, and they go to a restaurant, and then he goes on to say, I hope you're not one of those girls who's afraid to eat on a first date. And then he proceeded to talk about himself for two hours straight. What a catch. But she let him talk about himself because she was so infatuated with him. She goes on to tell a story of Dave treating her like absolute crap for a whole year, being his booty call and all the while she thinks that he's her boyfriend. Dave's friends call her the 19 year old and one day at a party, Rachel introduces Dave to someone as her boyfriend. Dave gets so annoyed at her that he says to her, and I quote, you've never acted your age before, but last night it was like it was written on your shirt. And then they didn't speak for two weeks. He flirted with other women in front of her. He would go out with friends, get drunk, and not invite her, but he would call her afterwards after he'd got home for sex. She didn't believe in sex before marriage, but she eventually did it with him anyway, just to desperately keep a hold of him. Rachel basically spends the whole chapter just blaming herself for Dave's actions, which doesn't seem healthy. She just vaguely says that he had baggage, which made him immature, and then outright says that she just doesn't blame him for anything. She says he acted that way because she allowed him to. And then one day he properly breaks up with her because he's moving too far away from her to be an economically viable booty call, basically. I am 100% the practical, pragmatic, sometimes change to reality person. They probably just sat down and did the maths and worked out the petrol money was more than just, you know, hiring a hooker for the night. So then the next day he calls her to ask her if she's okay and then tries to get into some small talk about her family, which why would you break someone's heart and then call them the next day for a light-hearted catch-up? Seems like extremely manipulative to me. Like he wanted to stay friendly with her just in case he was ever back in the area and wanted to hook up again. That's what it sounds like to me. But at that point, she decides to not even engage with him in conversation and breaks off the relationship entirely and tells him that she never wants to speak to him again. So this is her showing strength. And anyway, the story ends up with Dave turning up at her house the next morning and banging on her door. And she describes it like it's a movie or a romance novel. And then she says, after that moment, their love story was reborn. All of a sudden, life with him after that moment was great. No information about what he did to change, what she did to change, nothing. Just a magical fairy tale like ending. So basically, my takeaway from this chapter is that this 
This whole chapter could allow a woman to basically think that a husband or a boyfriend or a girlfriend or a fiance or any partner treating you like crap is their own fault. And not only that, but you should believe that that person can change it still uh, and one day marry them and spend the rest of your life with them. I hate to break it to you, Rachel, but 99% of the time in the real world, that's not true. You, you can't change someone else if they don't wanna change. And yes, someone will treat you a certain way if you let them, but it's still not your fault. It's, it's their fault if they're manipulating you because you're eight years younger than them and very clearly inexperienced when it comes to relationships. Dave was 27. I don't think there's any excuse to be made for him here whatsoever. As a side note as well, um, the book as a whole just seemed like very heteronormative as well. Like there's no mention of gay couples or lesbians anywhere I can remember up until the second to last chapter. Although I did hear that she was asked to remove the second to last chapter because her Christian publishers were not happy with it being in there but she fought back against it. So I do wonder whether she left out any LGBTQ content out of the rest of the book, just in case she did have to remove chapter 19, because then she could just simply remove it and the rest of the book would be completely clear of anything to do with that community whatsoever. It does make you wonder. It does also remind me of Lula Row in a way, Happy Hearts Club, they always seem so obsessed with couples and marriage and, they also seem quite heteronormative as well. Like I can't remember seeing any LGBTQ couples in their videos or any selling any leggings anywhere. That's interesting. She also never really flirts with the idea that breaking up with someone or divorce could ever be the best option. It's always about working through your issues with communication. Girl, <laughs> if your relationship has to end, it has to end. I think people need to realize this as well. In this interview, she even says that her relationship with Dave is more important than her relationship with her children. My marriage is my most important relationship. Like that comes before my children. Mm -hmm. um, my, that, like we have to be whole and solid for each other or we can't show up for these babies. She kind of excludes single parents here, like, and rather in all of her work, she doesn't really acknowledge them. Here she's like basically flat out saying, you can't be fully there for your kids if you don't have a partner. Moving on to Dave, it doesn't sound like everything came up roses completely after that night he showed up on her doorstep. Because Rachel tells stories about how Dave would get uncomfortable when she spoke about her business goals in front of him and his Disney executive mates. So she would intentionally play herself down because he and his corporate male executive mates expected everyone's wives to be housewives and baby machines. We learned our lessons, did we? Mm, not all of them anyway. He's still treating her like crap, in my opinion. Our conflict resolution styles, I shut down, he will battle you to the death. Like, he will battle to the death. So I'm like, oh gosh, like, if I try and talk to this guy about this huge thing, he's gonna, he's gonna debate me until I'm like, you know what, you're right, you know, which is what we had done for years. And you just pleased him, you're like, okay. Okay, you're right, I'm in. sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. Girl, if you need to go to a Tony Robbins conference to get the confidence to argue back to your husband, did the relationship really turn around that day? Was it really perfect that day? Actually sounds like you were just stuck in this terrible dynamic in your marriage for 14 years. And now you've got a podcast together and you're advising people on how to have a great marriage. It sounds like it's only been a good marriage for like the last two years. And before that, it was just generally terrible from like everything that she said. That's what I've got. She says how she was CEO of her company, but when he decided to join the company, he told her that he wanted to be CEO for the benefit of his own career prospects. In order for us to make this decision, I had to step down as CEO, which was very hard for my ego. <laughs> very so he's hard. So he's the CEO. He's the CEO. Otherwise, he um, wouldn't have done it. He wouldn't have done it. And that was a conversation that we mm. had. He was like, babe, if another company, and this was over many conversations, he was like, if another company tapped me right now to come and I would be, be tapped to be the CEO. Of some other startup. So, yeah. Like and, and it's good that he did because I would have 
continue to try and run it and, and the, do all of it and do all of it and the whole reason he's here is because i was struggling to do both like i can't run the company and be the face of the company simultaneously it's hard to be the talent yeah and the so we talked about it for a long time and that was um i really didn't i just loved like oh self-made ceo female ceo and then I had a girlfriend who said, have you ever just written down which parts of your job you actually like to do and see if they're the CEO job? And I did, and I was like, oh, holy crap. No, I don't wanna be CEO. Mm. I don't wanna figure out the finances. I don't wanna hire people. I don't, what I care about is the content. I, I care about the way it looks. I care about the experience that you have. I wanna write, I wanna look at the visuals. Like I'm the creative, I'm chief creative officer. I don't know what to read into that, but it just sounds a bit like he's still in control of this relationship. <laughs> I don't wanna psychoanalyze anyone I don't know though, but that's what she makes it sound like in all of her interviews and everything. So Dave has his own self-help book out now called Get Out of Your Own Way. And yes, that title has been used before because it seems the Hollises are incapable of coming up with anything original, but we'll come to that. So I haven't read Dave's book, but I came across a great review here from the Washington Post and I'll read you an excerpt of the review, which goes some way into explaining the gaping plot hole in Rachel's book about how Dave became a better husband. Dave Hollis tells a story about how he became a better husband. His wife, Rachel Hollis, the massively successful self-help guru of the moment, told him that she was pursuing a lucrative deal for her company. Dave scoffed. There's a 3% chance it'll happen, he told her. Months later, Rachel presented him with a gift you got me, a bracelet with a charm reading 3% stamped on it. She'd landed the deal. Now that's a masterclass in effective passive aggression, and thank God for that. Dave writes, strangely triumphant. Passive aggression can be effective, no doubt, but only in Hollisville will you find somebody who'll tell you it's the path to a healthy marriage. Every chapter of Get Out of Your Own Way closes with a takeaway section headlined, things that helped me. At first, it seems like an act of modesty, an acknowledgement that what worked for him won't necessarily work for you. But ultimately, it's narcissistic, a way for him to tell stories about his ongoing growth and fulfillment the mountains he climbed, the revenue targets he hit, and frame it as actionable advice. Success in Hollisville isn't becoming a better person who's more engaged with the world. It's craven careerism, it's admiration and money. It's running your flaws through a sparkly Instagram filter. It's thinking you're improving when spite dangles off your wife's wrist. Boom. And I find that very true of Rachel's book as well. A narcissistic way basically for her to tell stories about the mountain she's climbed and the revenue targets that she's hit and the fancy handbags that she's bought and frame it as actionable advice. But we'll come to that too. So as I mentioned before, Rachel's changed Dave's mind about self-help and conferences. And when she convinced him to go to a Tony Robbins conference with her, Dave used to call it a cult. So now they run their own marriage conferences and Dave regularly speaks at Rachel's Rise events. And I do wonder whether rather than Dave having some sort of epiphany, what he actually realized when he went to the Tony Robbins conference was how much money he could make. I did some quick research on Tony Robbins and he is a wealthy, wealthy man. Oh, and on top of that, nine women have accused him of sexual assault. Uh, women who have been his staff members and followers have said that he's assaulted them on stage in front of thousands of people and when a woman said she liked the Me Too movement because it was making women feel safer, he called her out for having a victimhood mentality. He seems like a very shady guy, but that's another rabbit hole for another time. Truth. We went to their marriage conference last summer. We had spent time in their material, including their lives, their podcast, and I had read a book. As a coach and my husband a therapist, we were expecting a ton of value, new content, especially for the price point. We quickly learned that we were not her audience. It was duplicate material that we had heard many times on their other platforms. When they served us champagne and began to talk about Pandora's box of sex toys and how they enjoyed turning Dave's penis into a vibrating sex pistol with the cock ring they enjoyed so much, but oops, she said it was the alcohol's fault. We asked for a $1,700 refund. Disappointed does not even begin to describe. Bye to all the Felicias. Just one more thing, don't take advice from Dave about how to survive a dog attack. There are these two 
very large golden retrievers, right? So they're, they're big dogs. And the gate that has opened to let their car go out is now leaving the yard. The gate is still open. I'm running towards the open gate. These dogs, they were beasts. They got up on their back two legs. They're now like running towards me. And as soon as they saw me, they came bounding over. And I went into full like, get, get back to your house. <laughs> and I like, I acted like I actually birthed these dogs. These dogs are running at me like they were about to attack me and I was like, nope. I am currently your master. You will listen to me. Let's get back into the yard. And immediately, like immediately, they were like, okay, sounds awesome. So, uh, that happened. You will listen to me. Let's get back into the yard. Now on page 13 of this book, we get the infamous story about Pam. The part of this book that gets the most vitriol from reviewers. Basically, she tells a story, a fictional story, about a co-worker called Pam, who is uh, doing a diet called Whole30, which sounds like some bullshit MLM diet, to be honest. And in the break room, she sees her eating a meat lover's pizza. Friend from work was constantly starting something new. Every three Mondays, she announced a new diet or goal, and then two weeks later, it just ended. What if you called her on it? Like, hey, Pam, I thought you were doing Whole30. Meanwhile, Pam is sitting in the break room eating a meat lover's pizza and telling you she was doing Whole30, and even though it made her feel great, two weeks into the program, her son had a birthday party, and she couldn't resist the cake, and then figured there was no point. Now she's gained back the pounds she lost, plus a few extra. Rachel goes on to ask this rhetorical question. Y'all, would you respect her? The woman who starts and stops over and over again? Would you count on Pam or the friend who keeps blowing you off for stupid reasons? Would you trust them when they committed to something? Would you believe them when they committed to you? I'm sorry, I don't know why I have to put on a really bad American accent when I read from the book. Basically, Rachel will judge anyone who gives up on a diet <laughs> and puts on a few pounds rather than losing some. And she expects us all to feel the same. So despite not being a nutritionist or doctor or having studied anything in the field, um, she helpfully gives us some advice on page 182. I believe that humans were not made to be out of shape and severely overweight. And she also says you need to be healthy, you don't need to be thin. But she constantly insinuates that even being 50 pounds overweight is just a terrible way to be. Even the people who enjoyed the book in general disliked the sentiment in this chapter. So she's basically saying like it's not okay to be overweight is what I took from that chapter, which is a bold statement um, in a world that really needs more understanding, I think. Rachel tells a story in the book about dealing with comfort eating, causing her to become overweight in the past and how she got through that. The whole message being that you don't have integrity if you can't stick to a diet and shed off those 50 pounds. And I think it says a lot more about Rachel's issues with body image more than anything in a way. Not because they're my legs, but because like Landon should be someone that we wanna be and I wanna be tall and thin. Hey, it's Rachel. Hollis. <laughs> hey, it's Rachel. Rachel who? Hollis. Or that, yes, like, had my I do. Protruding, are you pregnant belly? Yeah, and we, we would go to, both to be Denny's. We're much chubbier than we are right now. Show old pictures. There's of a really us bad picture of us playing croquet looking God, like chipmunks. God, it's so bad. Ooh. I look like I got stung by a thousand bees. Your hair game is also unbelievably <laughs> better because that picture also oh, my showcases hair was so bad. A, a lack we're of We're such of better. Hair. We're so much better looking. <laughs> my hair, everyone's it's hair. It's shocking Jack's how much hair. better looking Every, we Everyone's are hair now is better, really. Than we were then. Stung by a thousand bees? You're just a bit chubbier than you are now, and like a lot of women who follow you are gonna be similar weights to what you are in those pictures, and now they're gonna be thinking that they look like they've been stung by a thousand bees? And Dave, a protruding pregnant belly? Holy Christ. So she does tell people to unfollow 
Instagram models who have like six pack abs, which are unattainable bodies for many women to have, who are mothers and are also trying to work, etc., or for any reason. So that's a good thing that she tells people to unfollow these Instagram models. And I agree with her sentiment here. But I feel like women following Rachel Hollis on Instagram in a way is just as bad because she's per perpetuating the same kind of feeling in the women who follow her. Like they want her wealth, they want her carefully curated happiness and it's not real. You aren't gonna be in a good mood all the time, which she seems to be on her Instagram. I know that you know, on social media, every woman has six pack abs, but like I have a muffin top. I don't know like hey I know that that mom is like killing it and her kids are in 75 activities and they're you know they say yes ma'am and no sir you know my kid just rammed his head into the wall and lit the kitchen on fire so that the other 75 moms who have the same day can go like praise the lord me too like I'm not the only one there's this pressure from Rachel not to have six pack abs but to be constantly happy but most of all rich. In this BuzzFeed article there are a couple of quotes from a woman who used to work for Rachel. For me the point where it became really dangerous was when I noticed a fat shaming component to her platform, Moore said. There's a lot of talking about being overweight is hindering you from achieving your dreams or if you don't stick to your diet then you're not a person of integrity. That shaming component is really harmful. I realized that either I had to kind of adjust some of my expectations in order to continue working there or change some of my views about my own body. She does also seem to have an unhealthy relationship with food even now. She always touts this recipe for a green smoothie that she makes every morning because it fills her up and it's so good for her, but she says it tastes horrible. <laughs> and then of course there's people in the comments like, oh girl, you need Arban. <laughs> You need Juice Plus, girl. <laughs> Shakeology. So she puts losing weight down to simply burning more calories than you take in in the book. And I'm no expert, but I wouldn't put myself in the position of trying to give advice to like millions of women who have different relationships with food and different body types. I've heard this fact about calorie burning, like it's not wrong, but it's also not that simple. And also I've heard that dieting just doesn't work most of the time. But it also comes down to the fact that Rachel has time to work out because she's got a nanny and a home gym and she's used personal trainers in the past and she can simply afford to not be overweight. Like she makes it seem like it should be that easy for everyone. Oh, and she's recently decided to release the Rise app in which Rachel tries her hand at being a fitness coach because Rachel doesn't know how to stay in her own lane at all. Another tidbit of advice Rachel constantly touts to her followers is that they must drink water. Cheers to that, Rachel. Uh, specifically, as she says on page 183, if you take your weight in pounds and divide it by two, then that's the amount of water that you should drink in ounces. And I had to do a lot of converting here on Google to try and work out what the hell that meant because I work in metric, but I've worked out that for me, that would be nearly two liters. I've looked into this and any recommendation about how much water you drink per day is very contested by science and health professionals all around the world. Many of them actually agree that it's absolutely fine for you to just drink water when you're thirsty because you also get loads and loads of hydration out of the foods that you eat and also from things like tea and coffee. It's preaching, Ms. Hollis said recently. In the church I grew up in, or honestly in any church I've gone to, the pastor always is using stories from their real life to illustrate a point to you. So that's what I do. So by publishing her book for a Christian publisher, Rachel managed to get her books to the top of the Christian faith bestseller list, which has made her pretty well known in the Christian community. Unfortunately, even though Rachel clearly wants to have the Christian community under her wing along with atheists and people of other religions, she alienates a lot of Christian women with her use of faith in her work. So just some of the comments under that interview from Rachel on a Christian YouTube channel. Rachel never mentions Jesus, God or her faith in any interviews. Why do you even have her on this channel? 
Wow, she really worships herself, doesn't she? I do not see the fruit of the spirit here at all. A lot of you and self references. I don't understand why she calls Tony Robbins her hero if she is following Jesus Christ. I really don't understand. I've also come across some blog posts from Christian women who have had their viewpoints on her to share. What is Rachel Hollis's dream? I felt actual sadness when I read it. Jesus never called us to chase after power, money and fame. He actually had quite a bit to say about those things. He called us to lay our pursuit of all that stuff down and follow him. He said, whoever finds his life will lose it and whoever who loses his life for my sake will find it. She posted something that said, um, it doesn't matter what religion you are, who you worship. Yes, it does matter who you worship and who your God is. Um, and if you were in a position and you have a following like that, you need to be careful the words that you speak, especially when you claim to be Christian and you're just saying things straight against the Bible and um, the God that you claim to serve. So that kind of heated me up and followed her everywhere. One of my friends is in a MLM business and Rachel Hollis stood on stage and um, claimed Beyonce as her Lord and Savior. Then you know that is straight blasphemy and um, it just breaks my heart that somebody could do that. Um, that's not a joke. That is not a joke that she bows down to her. Um, that is Satan working through Rachel Hollis. Meaning what? Oh, example. I put a post up um, a few weeks ago, and I honestly didn't even think anything of it. I was sitting on my back patio having wine. Yeah. And people lost. So we're their in big mind. trouble right oh, now. Oh, we are. We have offended half of America. Okay. Um, but <laughs> people okay were so that. upset. You know, you said you were a Christian and you're drinking and you're mm -hmm. perpetuating. And I was like, first of all, mm -hmm. whoa. Right. She also, at one point in Go Wash Your Face, quotes a passage from the Bible, but just attributes her own meaning to it, which has triggered some pushback from Christian followers too. The passage is, let marriage be held in honor among all and let the bed be undefiled. And then she goes on to say, what I take away when I read that line is that the things that happen in my bed with my husband cannot be weird or bad or wrong. So she takes it to mean that it's not unchristian to experiment or get a bit freaky in the bedroom, but it's actually about adultery. One thing I think is good about Rachel's advice, and it's directed towards the Christian community, is that she tells people to go to therapy like she does in her speech to the military wives. Who goes to therapy, wants to go to therapy, think about therapy? Are you kidding me? 12 people? The therapy in Christian communities, I've read it, holds a bit of a stigma because like the general consensus is that you should go to God and go to church for all of your answers. So I think this is a good thing. Now I'm not of any religion myself, so I can't really comment on Rachel's use of religion in her work from a place of experience, but it seems to me like maybe, maybe she should leave the religion out. I'm not sure, but when I was reading the passages in the book, being non-Christian, the Bible passages and references to God, like they didn't bother me, but they also didn't resonate with me at all. So Rachel has never disclosed her political affiliation, although she does have a book by Michelle Obama on her color coordinated bookshelf that she regularly films in front of. And I've not seen any books about Trump. <laughs> From what I've read about her opinions on certain subjects in her book, I do believe Rachel is a progressive, liberal woman. But she also knows many, if not a large majority of her following is based in red states. Women in red states and 53% of white women voted for Trump. So the closest Rachel ever got to speaking about her views on politics was in one YouTube video from August 2016, a few months before Trump was elected, which has now been privated. She said the current state of politics was terrifying, but then went on to say, I'm not gonna talk about my beliefs or my political affiliation because I know that we're gonna, some of us disagree and I'd rather not know if you disagree. Now, I don't blame Rachel for not speaking about politics on her platform because it always tends to alienate a lot of people. In her case, it, it may well alienate perhaps most of her followers. So her decision to interview Joe Biden was interesting. To be honest, she was probably mainly thinking about elevating her own career um, as he would have been the most famous person that she'd ever interviewed. However, for many reasons, I think people will be following Rachel for the same reason that they voted for Trump. People believe that he's a good businessman 
because he was the host of The Apprentice and there's a load of buildings and casinos with his name on them. And for some reason that means that he'll bring jobs back to America because he's good at business, even though running the government is a completely different ball game. But in reality, he's kind of okay at business, he got there by inheriting a lot of money and ripping off a lot of less fortunate people. So people see Rachel's financial success and they believe that having her as their leader or their guru, she will bring them along to prosperity with her. But that's the thing, like I believe that Rachel, although she works clearly very, very, very hard, she's also lucky to be where she is. And it's the same with Trump. She never really acknowledges her luck. I was listening to a podcast called The Worst Best Sellers and they reviewed Girl Wash Your Face. It's a great episode, go listen. And one of them described Rachel as Christian mom heart. <laughs> so as in she's beautiful clearly, but not in a way that's threatening. She's not steal your boyfriend hot. And I agree, like I think it's served her very well. And I think that is along with her natural tenacity and work ethic, and her very personable nature and talent for speaking under pressure that got her that job at Miramax in the first place, even though she was underqualified. And that ended up being a launch pad for the rest of her career. But not everybody has that. Not everybody interviews well or looks the part for the job that they want to get. Neither do they meet a well paid man at that job, which becomes their husband and then helps her financially to start up her own party planning business. But we'll come to that. For example, you can't deny her whiteness probably helped her. Non-white women deal with systematic racism constantly. And she's also made it in spaces that are female dominated as well, like party planning and lifestyle blogging. And she's never had to deal with the setbacks that a normal woman faces when trying to get into male dominated careers. She was also pretty blessed with good timing. I think on some parts, she started a blog like just before online blogging got pretty big and influencers became a really big thing. We're not all on a level playing field, but we need to, to an extent, help each other out. But that's just my opinion. Don't come for me. Or if you want to come for me, do it in a respectful way. But I think her boot strapping philosophy and the way that it's garnered such like a loyal following is very telling of American and British politics as they are today. Are we only truly responsible for our own destiny? And it, it makes me think of all the current conspiracy theories about certain cell towers being the cause of a certain virus and making it worse by <laughs> making us weaker. But do you know what you're doing now? You're laying 5G? Yeah. You realise that, don't you? Yeah? Yeah. So what, you know that kills people? Because people are trying to find order in chaos, people want to believe that they're in charge of their own destinies. Because in reality, the world is unpredictable and random. Terrible things happen all the time that we can't explain, like this virus, and people want to believe that somebody intended this to happen. People want to believe that somebody was in control of this virus, so there must be a way to control them to stop it happening again. In the same way, people want to follow Rachel because they want to believe that they have control over their own lives to be able to have a life like hers. Well, that got deep. Well, I'll finish this section with a quote from the book Bright Sighted, how positive thinking is undermining America and then we'll move on. <laughs> As the economy has brought more layoffs and financial turbulence to the middle class, the promoters of positive thinking have increasingly emphasised this negative judgement. To be disappointed, resentful or downcast is to be a victim and a whiner. No doubt the growing financial insecurity of the middle class contributes to the demand for these products and services. America has historically offered space for all sorts of sects, cults, faith healers and purveyors of snake oil and those that are profitable, like positive thinking, tend to flourish. George W. Bush has been a cheerleader in prep school and cheerleading a distinctly American innovation, according to Bob Woodward. Condoleezza Rice failed to express some of her worries because, she said, the president almost demanded optimism. 
He didn't like pessimism, hand-wringing or doubt. The truth is that Americans have been working hard for decades to school themselves in the techniques of positive thinking, and these included the reflexive capacity for dismissing disturbing news. So what Rachel doesn't seem to mention much about in her book at all is her own privilege. And it's not surprising, it's a self-help book. It's supposed to sound like she's made it through from rags to riches. And she mentions her grandparents a lot were cotton picking okies from time to time. And she puts across the idea that her parents were poor, even though I don't think they were terribly poor. As I mentioned, her dad had a bachelor's, a master's and a doctorate in business management, and he was a pastor. I know that they can be well paid, though not necessarily. I've heard it depends on how hard you can blow viruses away. In her second book in her self-help series, Girls Stop Apologizing, she touches on the subjects. I haven't read that book, but thankfully someone posted an excerpt of it in the Facebook group, Girl Shut Your Face. <laughs> I have a photo from that time of my 11th birthday party with a handful of friends from school in this rundown, shabby apartment. I remember being embarrassed. I remember the box cake mix in an old Pyrex. I remember that we couldn't afford decorations. I remember being hyper aware of two things. First, I didn't want the kind of life where I lacked funds for special occasions. Second, it's not very convincing to assert your independence, from my mother in this case, if you don't have the financial means to back it up. I vowed to myself that day that I could be wealthy when I grew up. It was my birthday candle wish. I stood in that tiny dining room on stained carpet in front of the yard sale table and I promised myself something better. I will never live like this when I have the ability to prevent it. I was vehement in this. Someday I would be rich. So by the sounds of it, this happened after Rachel's parents' divorce. Rachel's mother has thrown a party for her birthday and provided everything she can to ensure that she celebrates her birthday to the best of her abilities. She's got friends and loved ones around her and all Rachel can think about is how poor she thinks she is. Like this is just insane. Either she's lying to get some point across or she has been insanely obsessed with money since she was 11 years old. I don't know what anyone else was like when they were 11 but when I was 11, I was barely aware of how wealthy my parents were or all the people's parents were. How did she even know any better? She said she came from a small, low income town. Like were all of her friends from Bel Air or something? I don't understand. <laughs> if this is true, I'm very sad for her and, and especially for her mother. But it seems that Rachel's obsession with all things materialistic just never wavered into adulthood. In chapter 13, she talks about seeing a woman on the street with a tiny Louis Vuitton bag. And she said the bag represented the kind of woman she dreamed of becoming. So rich, basically. This tiny bag costs a little over a thousand dollars. Then she talks about seeing a woman with that very bag in the street with perfect hair and makeup and a cute outfit and that she vows that one day she wanted to be as stylish as that woman, AKA rich. It's funny how she never really mentions any other female role models in the book, other than this one woman that she saw in the street one day wearing expensive clothes. It's the only role model that Rachel mentions. Nothing about wanting to help people with her platform or nothing about wanting to change the world in a positive way with her time on this earth. It's literally, all about money and on page 71 she mentions that her biggest dream is to have a vacation house in Hawaii so much so that she keeps a picture of one inside of her closet door she just completely normalizes being so materialistic and she doesn't question why she wants such shallow things and extract perhaps the deeper issues that we have in society to do with capitalism and desiring like wearable status symbols in the form of overpriced bags. One of the little tidbits of advice also is to write down your goals. So Rachel said that she wrote down in a journal every day, I only fly first class. Why don't you aim higher, Rachel? Why don't you put down I own a private jet. Right. Now, this dope filled world. Right. And get in an air, get in a long tube with a bunch of demons. Then you'll be a proper preacher. <laughs> One huge part of her privilege that she literally never mentions in the book, unsurprisingly, is how her marriage to David, 21, 
benefited her. He was head of international distribution at Disney, so he was responsible for getting Disney movies into cinemas all over the world. And he got paid a lot. I don't know how much, but in this Lewis House interview, um, he mentions in passing that he was on seven figures. So if he's right, that would mean that he was earning at least a million dollars every year. So as soon as Rachel married Dave and she had him on lockdown like a virus, she left her job and pursued her party planning business. And yes, it takes a lot of hard work and tenacity to be able to start a successful party planning business in LA, but it also takes a lot of capital. Rachel had the safest capital in the world being married to a man who was on seven figures and it was he was never in any danger of losing his job. Like he said it himself, like the job was too easy. I've been doing a job where I could not fail and not because of me but because of the strength of the team and the strength of the slate. The movies were too good and the teams are too great. He was never challenged in his job, so it was too easy. So how effing lucky were you, Rachel, that you were in that position? So yeah, it's funny that she never mentioned it. And also in, in her Made For More documentary, she tells the audience about a boob job that she has. And I don't know if she like meant the story to be particularly inspiring, but I don't know how it could be, really, but she talks about the state of her breasts after having three kids in this sort of quirky fashion. We are all on the same level. I, you know, might know how to do my makeup or I might have pretty hair, but I have the same gross stuff, weird stuff, funny stuff, embarrassing stuff that you do because I never want it to feel like that there's any difference between you and I. You look like an old tube sock and you filled it with yogurt, okay? And not even like, not even like Greek yogurt, not the thick yogurt, like this is like Activia. Like, that's in the bottom of the tube sock. And I'm sorry, but the nipples are now, they're facing down. They're downward facing dog. <laughs> Do your ears hang low? Do the, yeah, that. She's describing them like they're disgusting. Rachel, there are going to be women in the audience who have had children and who have boobs like the ones that you're describing and maybe even worse and she's basically like stood on the stage doing body shaming here and it's probably making some of the women in the audience feel terrible about their bodies because they're looking up to Rachel and she, she goes on to tell a story about how she goes and gets surgery to correct them because guess what Rachel has enough money to do that but what about the women who don't have enough money to do that Rachel should they maybe try and accept their bodies and love their bodies as they are no you should get up at 5 a.m and work so hard at your MLM business that one day you can have a boob job and fix the things that are wrong with you <laughs> because you're wrong and ugly and wrong <laughs> And then it comes to a scene where she's talking about how important it is to like, talk about the hard things in her life. Like, bitch, was that hard? Was that a hard thing that you had to go through? Ugh. It's just like a stark, it's a stark contrast to that original bikini photo that she posted years ago about accepting and loving your body after having children. But she constantly tries to make herself smaller against her own advice in her book to make herself seem relatable to her audience. Today I decided to do egg whites and spinach, which is one of my go-to. That's breakfast. not what a real morning routine looks like. Let me show you mine. So this is whey protein powder that I mix with a little water. It's a great way to stay full and get your breakfast really quickly. Unfortunately, I think it tastes disgusting. But after I choke it down, my coffee's usually ready, which is all I'm living for at this point. See, she's not perfect. She can't function without coffee. Oh yeah, like skipping breakfast and chugging a disgusting protein shake down. <laughs> I also hate food as well. <laughs> so real. <laughs> I actually eat pure building sand for breakfast. Fills you up till dinner time. And you literally shit bricks. <laughs> no calories absorbed. About 7.30 our nanny arrives, which is awesome because trying to get ready for work with three little boys can require some assistance. Oh, and she brings the nanny around. <laughs> so real and relatable. 
Don't even laugh, I totally wear a shower cap. I've gotta preserve this do because I don't actually know how to blow dry my own hair. It doesn't know how to blow dry her own hair. <laughs> So relatable. I also get mine done at the salon every few weeks too. Gotta keep that blowout fresh, you know. Oh, uh, and she has a home gym, just, just like all of us, yeah. Because who can be bothered to actually go to the gym, am I right? So relatable. Have you seen the traffic in LA? Next, I give all the boys a kiss, pack up my backpack, and then I grab one of my pre-made green juices before I head out the car to work. Oh my god, disgusting green juice to start off the day because nothing's changed since an hour ago. I still hate food. <laughs> so real. I know there weren't any special omelets or like really beautiful hair and makeup like the other girls on YouTube, but this is what my morning routine really looks like. Wow, so relatable, Rachel. Oh my god, I love her. Fuck omelet. It's funny how she never really mentions the nanny in her book as well until the acknowledgements at the end. Like she has a whole chapter about asking for help, which is a lot harder when you're not paying the person to look after your kids. <laughs> I, I moved to LA at 17 and pretty, um, pretty early on I started to meet some influential celebrity friends. Um, Paris Hilton was one of them. And through her, I met um, my boyfriend, Ray J. And our relationship then led to me getting a show on E! Um, which led to product lines. And when I started dating Kanye, I just... That is Kim Kardashian. So here, she even jokes about other people who've used their connections to elevate their own careers. Girl, you married a Disney executive. <laughs> Rachel's next book should be called, Girl, Marry a Disney Executive and then put up with his terrible personality for 14 years. It, there are definitely people who will read that I have a nanny or that I have a full-time housekeeper and will get pissed. Cause I've experienced it before. They're gonna be like, oh, must be nice to eat bonbons all day while someone else raises your children. I'm like, you know what, Pam, you don't know anything. No, Rachel, no one's saying you eat bonbons all day. You clearly work very hard, but so do other mothers out there. They just didn't have the same launch pad that you did. She hints little flexes here and there as well. On her YouTube channel, there's a video dedicated to Dave getting his new 69 Bronco built from scratch. I don't know how much that would have cost them, but it took them two years to make it from scratch just for him, to his exact specifications. One of the things the book has been attacked for is you say that anyone can kind of pull themselves up by the bootstraps and go. That's not true for everyone. And I disagree, Ms. Hollis told me. I just, to the marrow of my bones, disagree because there are too many people living in opposition of that belief. I moved to LA, left a crappy childhood, got three jobs and worked really freaking hard. I'm not saying everybody has the same opportunities. I'm not saying everybody has the same resources. Of course, they don't. But you, meaning the public, buying into the idea that it can't happen for you because of what your life looks like right now, doesn't serve you. It doesn't serve you. That's the hill I'll die on, she said. <laughs> oh no, Rachel. You forgot to mention your executive husband again, Rachel. Ah, uh, I know he's very easy to forget. Hollis equates having made it with being able to drop a lot of cash on a status symbol bag using purchasing power as a path to self-realization. Pentecostals have long associated spiritual blessing with material wealth, which may help explain why there is something talismanic about the Louis Vuitton bag for Hollis. It showed her hard work and strategic goal setting channeled the kind of earnest faith that God rewarded in the form of $10,000 consulting check. And I think that's interesting and the reason that she's so popular in the MLM space as well. A huge part of the marketing that people use to get people into MLMs is the materialistic wealth showcased by the higher up consultants. The getaway retreats and the pictures you see all over social media, it's all designed to make you feel like you're missing out on something awesome. And Rachel's goals are the same. Her picture of a vacation house in Hawaii pinned inside her closet door. It's parallel to those pictures of leadership retreats. It's, it's a destination that you can get to when you can achieve and it's completely materialistic. And they'll say that you're helping other people in MLMs, such as using words for roping people in, into the scheme like sponsoring to make you feel a bit better about wanting it, like the benign belief that you're helping other people by roping them into a scheme. 
like it makes you feel good it makes you feel charitable in like the most messed up way ever but in reality it's all about that lucrative vacation the car and the louis vuitton bag but why 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 is rachel so obsessed with money well in part i think she knows who her audience is which is why she talks about it so much she knows exactly who's paying those huge MLM speaking checks and she wants them to keep coming. If you need to know why MLMs are bad then watch this video. But her audience is MLMs and military wives. MLM MWs. She doesn't really keep it a secret either. She knows this. People know it. Thank you for hollering at the other girls on your MLM team to read it. Thank you for telling the other wives on base that it's worth their time. That being said, she's stopped speaking on other people's stages now, she said. So she said she's only gonna be speaking at her own conferences from now on. I'm guessing because they're so big now that they're making more money than the MLM conferences ever did make her. That doesn't mean that she's no longer supporting the industry. For example, I think Debbie Neal from Arban would be very pleased with the chapter called The Lie. No is the final answer. Although she does say at the end of the chapter, don't harass people again and again, but rather find an alternative route, like leave 30 messages on an answer machine. <laughs> in this keynote speech, Debbie Neal tells a story about how she called someone 30 times in the early days of her business and filled up her voicemail machine. 30 times! And then, then she goes on to say how she's now one of her highest earning downlines, this person that she harassed. So here is Rachel doing a motivational speech at a doTERRA convention. Remember Pam? Now she's a Karen. <laughs> Imagine a voice in your head. Think of all the things. Now give that voice a physical manifestation. If you had to imagine the voice in your head as a real person, think of what he or she would look like, right? I'll give you mine. Feel free to use her. Her name is Pam. <laughs> She has Kate Gosselin's haircut from John and Kate Plus A. Not Kate Gosselin now. Kate Gosselin when the show first started. You guys know what I'm talking about? Pam always wants to speak to the manager. She's always upset, right? She's that, you guys know who I'm talking about, right? Rachel, you can't describe a Karen to a room full of Karens and then go and call her Pam. <laughs> her name is Karen. We all know what you're talking about. <laughs> Hang on a minute. When Rachel was judging Pam for eating pizza. Hey Pam, I thought you were doing Whole30. Pam was actually the voice inside Rachel's head. The voice inside Rachel's head telling her she's ugly and fat and she'll never amount to anything. Looks like Pam got Rachel back. Go Pam. Eat pizza and cake and insult Rachel Hollis. Be more Pam. I know Rachel tried to deafen you one time, Pam, but super loud. Where like some of the older people are gonna be like, "Oh, my ears! Don't worry, you're fine, Pam." You got this. You're stronger than her. We're hashtag Team Pam. Anyone hovering right under a number in revenue or right under a certain amount of team members, and they just can't get past it. Anyone here? So for me, I was that that million dollars, and so I heard this guy talk about it. And he said it's a psychological threshold, and what you will do if you're not mindful of it is you will start to self-sabotage. You will actually prohibit yourself from going past it, not knowing. Who doesn't look at either business or personal finances because you don't want to know? Thank you for your honesty. That was me. Anyone have someone right now who's actively judging them for being at something like this? Yeah. Uh, our favorite part of any Rachel Hollis speech. Who here is actively judging you? Well, if any of us are 50 pounds overweight, Rachel, then you're judging us. <laughs> you are a small business owner, and small business owners are the backbone of this country, and that is something to be proud of. People in MLMs are not small business owners, Rachel. Um, you're just lying here. And I know you know that's a lie, Rachel, because you're a clever girl. And right now you're unsure, and right now you don't know, and right now you're like, what happened? There is so much potential. Right now you're unsure, right now you don't know. So she's like tapping into the mindset here of like the exact kind of person who would join an MLM. Someone who feels lost 
And she knows most of these women's businesses are like not going well. In the podcast, The Dream, a journalist goes to one of the conferences and she said every woman who she spoke to in the conference for, for Limelight, which was the MLM conference that she went to, she said every woman there was, was complaining about how badly their business was going and they were there at the conference to try and lift up their spirits because they weren't making any money. So Rachel knows that all of these people are just sad and failing. Attempting to grow to a new level in your multi-level marketing business doesn't just require classes and webinars and a sick social media presence. It also requires someone to help you around the house since you will have less time for that. It's impossible to build big things entirely by yourself. A whole team of people helped me build my company over the last decade. It took family and babysitters and nannies to help keep our family afloat during the times I had to put in extra hours. In an MLM, why don't you just hire a babysitter and a nanny and plunge further into debt? Took the world's biggest cheerleader as a husband, celebrating my wins and covering my losses both financially and emotionally in those early years. <laughs> I'm sorry, the biggest cheerleader in the world as a husband. That's what Dave is now. The one that for years made you feel ashamed of your own goals so you minimize them in front of him and other people. Right. Also the one who told you that there's a 3% chance that you get that deal. That one? He's a cheerleader? Is he? I'm just imagining Dave Hollis as a cheerleader now. I've got a Bronco. I used to work for Disney. I'm feeling very when my wife is more than me. She's got four kids, but she says that I'm the favorite. I talked to her so much. She bought a passive aggressive bracelet. So I took over her business, took her job of CEO of myself and off the renewed to the hardest part. I paid you guys my book title and bought myself a whip. Now I have a pre-purchase tattoo about a shit. Be oppressive, be, be oppressive, be oppressive, be, be oppressive. So Rachel is no stranger to mingling with people in the multi-level marketing space. Ed Milet, for instance, who is interviewing her here, by the way, the title of the video is Watch This If You Struggle With Self-Doubt. And he has loads of videos titled this way in order to like fish for people who are probably easily manipulated and then uses his platform to make himself into this person that you should be looking up to. Like he's incredibly rich and he's part of this MLM called world financial group one where they sell insurance or something and the whole industry just makes me sick so rachel has endorsed the industry throughout her whole career so here she is interviewing jessica honiger the ceo of a jewelry mlm and rachel can be seen wearing their necklaces all the time um, and i've gone onto their website and there's this huge banner on their homepage, of course, exploiting the current situation that many women are in right now, touting themselves as the answer. Stay home, stay connected, earn a paycheck with a purpose. And here she is bigging up LuLaRoe leggings, of course. I tried LuLaRoe leggings. They feel like butter and are amazing. This is from Emily. Yes, I have. That's what I wear around the house. I have some spider web and some ones that look like the Jamaican flag and they feel great. By the way, I did a whole documentary on LuLaRoe and it's a ride. You can see part one and part two of that on my channel. Go check it out. It's about why you guys want, would want to send things, but I promise you, you do, as long as they're not a bomb, I will open them on camera. Don't tempt me, Rachel. <laughs> oh, and speaking of LuLaRoe, look who it is. Our friend Lindsay Wheeler, the perpetual liar and pyramid denier. Who are doing incredible things for their family. They are reaching their goals today, five years after LuLaRoe started. You didn't have to get in when it first started to be successful. You can start today and build an incredible business. Why the fuck you lie? But if you've been working at something for the longest time and you can't figure out how to monetize it or you can't find any customers, it might be because it's a terrible business. Girl, say that at every MLM conference. This speech here is not at an MLM conference, it's just at a business conference. So I do wonder why she's not ever said that in any of her MLM speeches. It's a terrible business. There's no way to skip the line. There's no way to skip the line. So now we move on to Rachel's speech at the Beachbody MLM convention, which by the way, just the name of this company makes me feel sick. Every single thing that you need to do to level up, 
exists right now on the internet for free. Everything on the internet for free apart from Rachel's conferences. Even when they're just digital during a pandemic, uh, you still have to pay a lot of money for them. And for Rachel to tell you to have a plan when you lose your house, like move in with your mother-in-law. You will keep moving forward like you have so many other times in your life. So if that were to happen, what would you do? And be real right now. Being a leader is facing the reality of your situation. If there's a chance that you could lose your home, yes, that's scary. Yes, that's hard. Yes, that's terrifying. Write it down. I'm afraid that we're gonna lose our home because I lost my job. And if it happens, what will I do? Have a plan. You know what? I'll move in with my mother-in-law. Who is someone who is actively judging them for being in this room right now? You are, Rachel, because of that pizza that I just ate. So Rachel also says that you shouldn't fake it till you make it all the time. To go to that old saying, that old like, fake it till you make it. Whoever heard fake it till you make it? I hate that phrase. Because all that happens when you fake it is you alienate, alienate yourself from the community of people who could actually help you. You know that old saying, fake it till you make it? I hate that expression. I hate it. Because I think the only time you should fake anything is confidence. And I think that I've done really well with the idea of um, fake it till you make it. I think it's such a funny thing in business. You know, I do, I speak a lot at business conferences and it's a question that you get often. Do you believe in the idea of fake it till you make it? And I do because I think it's worked really well for me. <sighs> Although on page 34, she does, uh, she does admit that she has a flaw of hypocrisy. So we should all listen to her and feed her advice, right? And finally, we come on to Rachel's issue of uh, plagiarizing. So BuzzFeed originally called Rachel out for multiple instances of quotes being posted to Rachel's Instagram account, but without credit to the original author, but rather with credit to Rachel herself. And then after BuzzFeed called her out, the posts were deleted. She's especially fond of this Mark Twain quote that she parrots to applause every time that she uses it in speeches. Comparison is the death of joy. Comparison is the death of joy. The second that you start. And she also uses it on page eight of Girl Wash Your Face without credit. Also in this video, Savvy Wright's books, she points out a few plagiarized quotes that come up in Rachel's second self-help book, Girl, Stop Apologizing. And here uh, we've got Kiki Chanel pointing out some further examples from her Beach Body speech. In this interview, she's quotes Joe Dispenza. Joe Dispenza yes. said, in an age of this much free information, ignorance is a choice. Correct. So that's basically the same thing that she says, that same thing she absolutely loves saying in all of her own speeches is everything is on the internet for free. That's basically that Joe Dispenza quote. And that's the first time that I've seen her credit it to him. And by the sounds of it, she doesn't even know if it was him who really said it. And then on page 141 of her book as well, she literally admits to wanting to check if Mindy Kaling has trademarked her phrase cardio fantasies so she can turn it into her next book or line of activewear. On this morning routine video as well, she talks about how she gets up at 5 a.m. to read other people's books about management and leadership. And then she's literally hired highlighting phrases in the book that she's probably gonna steal at some point. So in chapter 19, there's only one right way to be. I actually thought that had a really nice sentiment to it. It was probably my favorite one. And it's the one that her Christian publishers allegedly wanted her to remove because it was too progressive for her conservative part of her audience, apparently. But it basically tells the story of how she grew up in a very sheltered little town. She only knew other white, Christian, straight people. And she talks about the first time that she left that town on her own. She saw two men holding hands in public and people of other ethnicities and, and how amazed she was. And she advocates going out and mingling with people who are not like you, who don't look like you, and don't vote the way you do, etc., just to widen your perspective, which is lovely. And then she ends the chapter on page 205 uh, with the quote, every year you close a new chapter in your story. Please don't write the same one 75 times and call it a life, which 
is a quote according to BuzzFeed, which came from Robin Sharma. So she kind of ruins it with a plagiarized quote right at the end. <laughs> but she does quote Maya Angelou in this chapter and credits her. Well, misquotes her, <laughs> but at least she tried. <laughs> but, but recently she came under fire for quoting Maya Angelou on her Instagram and just outright attributing it to herself and she got heavy, heavy backlash, especially from the black community and she eventually took it down and offered an apology, but she blamed her social media team for it basically. So that's great. So in conclusion, not everybody hates Rachel Hollis. A lot of people love her obviously, otherwise she wouldn't be so successful. I read her um, her book called Girl, Wash Your Face. This was a really good book. We just finished reading Girl, Watch Your Face, <laughs> Wash Your Face by Rachel Hollis. I cannot wait to hear what you all thought of this. I really loved it. So what's her appeal? Well, it's clear that a lot of women feel that they need to hear what Rachel's saying. Even if it seems like obvious advice, it does help to literally hear things and it can help you give that kick up the ass that you might need to start a new project and have the confidence to do it. But here's where she goes wrong. Hold on, hold on. I'm just, I just, I don't have time. I don't have time. It's just someone talking crap. She needs to listen to her haters. She constantly blocks people who leave comments criticizing her on her social media. And she admits on page 151 of Girl Wash Your Face that she once got one bad review on one of her fiction books early on. And since then, she's not read any reviews of her books at all. And her fiction books, from what I've seen, are actually quite good and didn't get that much negative reception. So she's not read one of the many, many bad reviews online about her two most recent books. And she's not seen any of the criticism she's getting. And I guess it's one way of dealing with your mental health when in the public eye. Like I could, I could choose to ignore my comment section altogether so I don't have to experience any of the abusive ones. But I wanna engage with my audience and I wanna hear the positive and the negative opinions about my work as long as it's constructive criticism because I wanna get better. But it's quite clear that Rachel just lumps this constructive criticism in with like all of her haters and ignores it all. And then consequently, she just doesn't actually realize when she's causing actual harm. The Buzzfeed article by Laura Turner describes Rachel's social media presence and writing like curated imperfection. She touts herself as being honest, but what is honesty when your life is your brand? She'll post pictures after a workout looking like all sweaty and realistic. And she reminds me of Lele Pons in a way, like posting like a super hot pic to like all of her 15 year old followers. And then and you swipe and she's like making like a goofy face because she's such like a nerd. <laughs> but she can because she's hot. <laughs> and she constantly posts about her like glow up. And the main thing that contributed to that was a nose job that most people couldn't afford and the fact that she got her braces taken off one day and that's it. <laughs> What's most disconcerting, however, isn't the mixed messaging. It's the writer's reference points or lack thereof. Because her own life is the story that she sells for a living, Hollis rarely looks beyond it. She turns inward in order to understand and explain the world and occasionally to the TV show Friends or a Drew Barrymore movie. That's fine if you're writing a journal, but less compelling when you're positioning yourself as an international feminist leader. She makes a big point of her own transformation from ungainly overweight child to adult object of desire, aided by a rigorous diet and exercise, a boob job, hair extensions and dyes, makeup artists and advice from stylists. But she also urges women to accept and love themselves. She tells ladies to dream unabashedly big then offers an example of this as a mum who gets in shape and loses weight for the sake of her family's health. I think Rachel is so popular because she's pretty good at saying things that feel great on a surface level, but she never really gets into the nitty gritty of like what she actually did to get to where she is in her business today. If she's ever asked anything about what she practically does in an interview, she just kind of avoids saying anything of value, like a politician just falls back to her usual tropes. And that's perhaps because a lot of it was 
look and she just doesn't want people to realize that and because it's not inspiring and it's not what people want to believe that they don't want to believe that it's look people don't want to believe that anything is scary or random or hard to understand your own moods and emotions are hard to understand and hard to control sometimes but you should try and understand them so you've got a better chance at controlling them not stamp them down into the stained carpet while crying into your box cake but some people like Rachel style because it's like real talk or tough love kind of style but is it though or is it just abusive Rachel didn't realize when Dave was being abusive to her so like and she still doesn't seem to realize and blames it on herself so Rachel's fans in a way are in an abusive relationship with her she will insult them in like passive ways until they blame themselves for their flaws then they drop at least $300 to go to a conference because Rachel's telling them that if they don't go then they're just making excuses again guys up 50 stop talking yourself out of it stop making excuses if you want to go you are a grown human you get to make that choice make it happen and if you have a spouse who you're worried about having to convince that this is a worthy thing I'm happy, right. I'm super happy to have a conversation with, frankly, anyone who is worried about that. Me to you, the woman who is maybe struggling with how to bring this up to your husband, or me to your husband, have, have either either of you. Or your wife. Is that a threat, Dave? Everything you need to know is on the internet for free, though. Apart from the stuff that you learn at RISE conferences, it's life-changing. And if your husband won't let you go, then Dave will have a word with him. I would call a subsection of Rachel's audience a bit like a cult following. You are the exact example of why other people's opinions of you don't matter. I have read both her books and I can promise you that if she read this article, she has enough self-confidence that your opinion doesn't matter. The refreshing thing that I learned from Rachel Hollis is that you are entitled to your opinion, bless you, from which I or anyone else who supports her or has their own opinion about her can comfortably move on without your words having any impact on their mind, goals, etc. I do believe that you exhibit this, the exact type of person that loves to pick apart something that is obviously doing something good for me. Millions, yes, millions of women, and turn it into a judgment fest to possibly make your own self feel better. But hey, that's none of my business. You do you. I think your opinions would have been more well received if they came from a place of your heartfelt advice rather than a place of pushing your beliefs by demeaning someone else. Stay positive. The irony of that last statement is not lost to me. It's the, the patronizing tone and like complete dismissal of just trying to truly understand what the article was really saying um, and falling back on the just be positive message just sounds exactly like every woman from an MLM who's been in my comments in my MLM videos before. The reality is we need people to criticize us so we get better, so we improve, as long as we do it nicely. And I found this one comment from an ex fan of Rachel interesting. I used to follow Rachel Hollis on Instagram and read some of her blog. I liked her, peppy, upbeat, funny. And then I realized that she was actually just capitalizing on my own lack of confidence, internal shame, and desperation to belong somewhere. The longer I was in that state, the more I would tune into her videos, purchase her books, buy tickets to her conferences, etc. She capitalizes off the exact situation women are experiencing that she is claiming to fix. But surely, as Rachel would tell you, no one can fix you, and not some stranger on a screen. Certainly not an upper class white woman in America who has, yes, worked hard for what they have, but undeniably been given the resources, lack of obstacles and oppression, and lots of luck to do so. What rubs me the wrong way with Rachel is the same as many other critics. She is a white wealthy woman that believes she is speaking to everyone. She seems to have no understanding of her blindness to intersectionality or how tone deaf her preaching is to anyone who doesn't fit in the same box. But there are some aspects of Rachel Hollis's personality that we can take inspiration from, like the determination that she had to self-publish her original fiction books, when publishers kicked her back again and again and again, admirable, the way that she moved out of weed patch at the age of 19 and got a job in LA, that was admirable. She was clearly mature, way beyond her years at that age. But her determination has sort of given her like a tunnel vision view of her career. And there's people outside of that tunnel who are like trying to tell her that she could do better. But she's got the blinkers on and she's powering through without thinking who she's harming in the process. And I think that's mainly young women in MLM businesses. 
And that kind of determination would be great if she was still writing fiction books to this day, but she's not. She's giving real advice to real women who are looking up to her and she's putting her fingers in her ears and singing la 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 when anybody tries to tell her that she might not be affecting these women in the positive way that she thinks she is. Or perhaps she knows full well how harmful she's being and she doesn't care because now she's got all the Louis Vuitton bags in the world that she could ever want and Dave's got his Bronco and she's well on her way to getting that beautiful vacation house in Hawaii. I had this idea a year ago because um, I'm such a nerd and I just love movies with dance numbers so bad. In this rise buildup, as much as I have participated in plenty of planning conversations, there are very few things that I've had an opinion on because it's not my strength. The only thing, I mean, this is the craziest thing, but the only thing, one of the only things that I really had an opinion on was the value of a finale. And I've seen Pitch Perfect and Sister Act 2, and I was like, wouldn't it be amazing if we had a finale? And so we're going to end this not like anybody else, not like any other video. But like how I would do it. Meanwhile, Pam is sitting in the break room eating a meat lover's pizza. Meat lover's pizza. Meat 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 lover's pizza. 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 Hey Rachel, it's Pam, the woman you talked down to. Can I speak to the manager? Alright, it's you. Am I in the break room or your head? Do you have amnesia? Don't mind me while I cry into my meat love, but pizza. I think you misunderstood the meaning of whole 30. You eat 30 whole pizzas and you drink when you're thirsty. I'm not dancing to your music. Can you turn it down? God damn. Down, down, down on my ears. Don't worry, you're fine, Pam. I can't afford a health plan. Don't worry, you're fine, Pam. I don't have a Disney man. Don't worry, you're fine, Pam. What if my MLM's a scam? Don't worry, you're fine, Pam. What if it's okay to live on a shoestring? You know, you know what, Pam? You don't know anything. Don't It came from a box. I can't afford a health plan. Don't worry, you're fine, Pam. I don't have a Disney man. Don't worry, you're fine, Pam. What if my MLM's a scam? Don't worry, you're fine, Pam. What if it's okay to live on a shoe You know what, Pam? You don't know anything. I can't afford a health plan. Don't worry, you're fine, Pam. I don't have a Disney man. Don't worry, you're fine, Pam. What if my MLM's a scam? Don't worry, you're fine, Pam. What if it's okay to live on a shoe You know what, Pam? You don't know anything. Hey, Pam. Hey, 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 Pam. Children. If you're tired of starting over, stop giving up.